Hey, hey, everybody, welcome back to Board Game Blender. I am Z Garcia. Today we are talking about parks and attractions. So it's, it's, oh, summer's almost here for those of us uh, on this hemisphere anyway. And I wanted to talk today about theme parks, about uh, attractions like the beach, like the zoo, stuff like that. Fun places where you can sit down at the gaming table and reminisce about that trip you had, or maybe start getting, uh, you know, psyched about an upcoming trip by playing a game that has a theme uh, that makes you think of that, you know? So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. But before we get to the episode proper, I have an announcement to make. I have here in front of me the winners of my Onitama contest. I have the two winners who are going to receive a copy, brand new copy of Onitama, as well as those uh, gold foil cards, which are very cool, very limited item. And the winners are Nikki Bussy and Rebecca Hyder. And so congratulations to Nikki and Rebecca. They're going to be receiving those very soon. So again, congratulations and a big, big thank you really to everybody who entered. You are all wonderful. I am, I am loving reading your suggestions and I think we're going to be using a lot of those uh, themes that you folks sent in. So a big thanks to, to for that. You know, it's nice to have you all uh, feel like a big part of the family, you know, participate with us in uh, in finding cool themes for us to explore. And so, again, I, I couldn't be more thrilled. Thanks, everybody. We had quite a few entries. We had over a thousand entries. So um, if you did not win, thank you for entering anyway. High stakes indeed. But congrats to our winners, all right? All right, here we go. Let's get to the show proper. Kick it off, fellas. Howdy, gamers. It's time once again for Buy, Try, or Deny. I'm Indiana John. Today we're taking a look at summertime games and summertime attractions. And it's actually still spring here in Indianapolis, but I thought I'd have a seat here on my back porch and talk to you about some summertime games. Uh, rather than give you three games this time that are one particular topic, I'm gonna look at three different aspects of summertime that I think are interesting and give you one game for each of those topics. So without further ado, grab your favorite summertime beverage and let's get started. <laughs> So one of the things that I think about in summertime is going on vacation to tropical locations. Now, it's beautiful and green here in Indiana in the summertime, but it can't really compare to an island location such as the island of Bora Bora, which is our buy game this time. Designed by Stefan Feld, one of my all-time favorite designers, and this is, I think, one of his best. It's probably in the top three for me as far as um, Stefan Feld games. In this game, you are doing all the things you normally do in Feld games to get points. In this case, you're putting huts onto a board, you're acquiring uh, men and women tiles that are like these different tribal men and women that'll give you special abilities and points, you're buying up shells and jewelry and things like that, and you're just enjoying your time on the island of Bora Bora. So the theme, uh, you know, may say, some may say it's pasted on, I, I think it's just about as good as any other stuff on Feld theme. And it's got cool artwork uh, with a beautiful island location on it and things like that. So uh, it makes me think of summertime, and that's our buy game this time, Bora Bora. So one of the other things that I really like about summertime is the game of baseball. And I realize that baseball has fallen out of favor with a lot of Americans and uh, games like American football and uh, basketball have maybe uh, gotten a little bit more popular, especially here in Indiana, basketball is huge. But uh, I've always loved the game of baseball and Harry's Grand Slam Baseball is a great little card game about baseball that was designed first in 1962. And it was reproduced by Out of the Box Games a few years back. It's a really simple game a back and forth of playing out the, uh, the, a few innings of a ball game uh, and scoring points or runs just like you would in a normal baseball game. There's a lot of randomness involved in it, and I'm, it, you can tell that it's a game from another era. But I think it's an awful lot of fun, and it, it definitely lasts, it lacks the sophistication of games like uh, Baseball Highlights 2045 or even Bottom of the Ninth. But I think it's a good, fun experience, and if you're looking for something that's real deep and strategic, this is not going to be your game. But if you're uh, getting ready to watch a ball game and you've cracked open a couple beers and you want to play a little card game that reminds you of baseball, uh, I would definitely give a try to Harry's Grand Slam Baseball. 
Our Denali game this time is actually about a uh, summertime topic or a summertime event that I really do enjoy, and that's amusement parks. Uh, but I don't really enjoy the game so much in this case, and that is Coney Island. Uh, in this game, you are trying to fill up your board with particular tiles that match attractions from a, uh, an amusement park, and you can buy bigger attractions and link things together. And um, the overall theme is very cool, and the artwork is nice, but the mechanics of the game are just way too tight for me. One thing that I don't like in games is when there is a really, really tight economy. And in this game, every little dollar seems to, to count and you just are trying to squeeze as much, uh, uh, as many points, as many actions as you can out of a very, very small amount of resources. And you can gain just a few over the course of the game, but uh, it's really very, very tight. And I just wasn't an enjoyable experience for me. And I'm not saying it's a bad game. It just definitely wasn't a game for me. And it was a deny and that's Coney Island. So there you have it, three games about summertime things. Our Deny game, Coney Island. Our Try game, Harry's Grand Slam Baseball. And our Fantastic Feld Buy game, Bora Bora. What kind of games do you like to play during the summertime? Let me know down in the comments and be sure to follow me on Twitter at IndieBoardGamer. So until next time, have a great summer and game on. Live, folks, welcome to the Sit Down Standards Unaccompanied Gamer. My name's David, and in this series of videos, we take a look at games that aren't just great for multiple players, but also offer a unique and exciting single player experience. Now, with this week's series of videos all about attractions and theme parks, I thought to myself, there's probably only one real way to get any research done on this topic. Now I'm a huge fan of roller coasters, but what I always thought would be more exciting would be the idea of building out my entire theme park. And that inspired me for this week's game, which is Steam Park from Yellow Games. In this game, players are going to be competing as different theme park creators, hopefully luring the local visitors of Roboburg to come and enjoy their theme park and rides over their opponents. Now the first thing you're going to notice about this game is that the components are absolutely amazing. All of the rides and attractions and stands all come in these amazing 3D models that you're going to be placing onto your, your fairgrounds inside your theme park. They come in a variety of different colors um, and they just really stand out when you're playing this game on the table. In addition, they also include some awesome custom dice, and these list all the different actions that you're going to be able to take during your turn, um, including things like building out more attractions, uh, having visitors come and visit your theme park, as well as playing bonus cards, and just generally working to keep your park clean. And that's one of the unique mechanisms of the game. Players are going to have to kind of balance a lot of different things while they're playing the game. Of course, you're going to have to build new attractions and new rides inside your theme park. You're going to have to lure and attract uh, different visitors to your theme park. Um, as well as you're going to have to mitigate uh, the dirt or the mess that's being created by all the different visitors uh, enjoying your park. Uh, because at the end of the game, any players who actually haven't uh, cleaned out enough dirt are going to have a negative effect and ultimately going to have to spend some of the money at the end of the game to clean that up. And remember, whoever has the most money at the end wins the game. Now, also, there's some unique mechanisms that this game offers. It has a couple different varieties of, of gameplay that you get to enjoy. One is the, the way that you actually determine the turn order of the game of each round. And that's by doing all players simultaneously do a roll-off. So every player is going to roll all six of their custom dice that they get and essentially slowly lock those dice that they want into their um, steampunk piggy bank. But the first player who gets all six dice where they want, they place them all in their steampunk piggy bank and they grab one of the turn order markers um, and that determines where they're going to be in the turn order. So in addition to not only being able to go first during their building or attracting visitors phase, um, they're also going to get some additional benefits including uh, having the ability to clean some of that dirt out before they really even start their turn. So there's a lot of great mechanisms in this game that offer a lot of unique uh, gameplay uh, abilities. Um, but don't let that fool you. The game is actually very streamlined, very easy to play. You can almost play this with anybody. It makes a great gateway game. And the game even offers uh, kind of two different uh, types of play. You can kind of play the easier mode or the full mode that's included in the game. Now, of course, this wouldn't be an unaccompanied gamer if this game didn't offer a single player experience. And it actually does. 
Uh, the game itself doesn't come with official rules for the solo variant, but the great folks over at Board Game Geek, one of the users over there, has created an awesome solo variant that really keeps a lot of the same spirit and feel of the game. Um, instead of doing that roll-off where players are actually working to roll their dice to get player order, what you ultimately do is anytime you re-roll, you're going to, as a single player, you're going to slowly take... Uh, the turn order, so if you roll twice, you take the second player. If you roll four times total, then you'll take the last player. In addition, there's also a great um, a variant that the uh, Board Game Geek user has created that mitigates the types of visitors that go into the bag that you're going to be choosing to send visitors into your park. So really, like I said, does keep the solo variant. But what I'll do is, if you want to check it out, I'll put it on my Twitter, the link. Uh, you can follow me at SitDownStandard. I'll put the link there so you can check out the solo variant if you're interested. Until next time, bye. Hey, hey, everybody. For today's game, Under the Radar, we are taking a look at a game that is under the waves, and that is Key Largo. Key Largo here is a game all about uh, running a diving operation in which you have one week in the game to dive and collect as much uh, treasure as possible because there is a big hurricane coming. And then the idea is that everything at the bottom will be shifted. You won't be able to find, uh, you know, to make good on the hints you've been given, basically. And so the game has a real bright look to it. It's got a very charming theme to it. Very summery, definitely. It's a, it's a good one to pull out during that season. And it's also a very... It's got a familiar feel to it. I think this makes a very good gift, a very good family game, especially for folks that are non-gamers, for folks that just know the monopolies and, and strategos of the world, if you would, this is a good one. You know, it's got a very simple system of pushing your luck, uh, and you are picking a couple of actions. You pick one in the morning, you pick one in the afternoon, and the actions are simple things. You can go and buy some goods to help you dive. You can go and sell the things you have found while diving. You can do the diving itself. The It's all basically just a push-your-luck idea, the diving itself, which is the central mechanism. You are flipping cards, and you pick your depth. You cannot go to the very deep parts until you buy some weights, some hoses. It's all very thematic, and uh, then whatever you find down there, you bring back up and you sell. The game has, um, you know, paper money here, which is, you know, very uh, well-known. You know, this, there's something... Uh, of relaxing and sort of like familiar about um, paper money. You know, I can bring this game out and I know if I bring out paper money with absolute non-gamers or, or just folks that are used to classic games, you know, like Monopoly, they're, they're not going to be intimidated by this. And I like that a lot. The whole look is wonderful. The game is uh, it's a pretty quick game. Easy to explain. Folks love the little divers here. You know, I think they're really charming. You You can hire more divers to go in there and help you out and the look of these guys is just wonderful uh they're uh irregular little cutouts but i think it gives the game a lot of charming charm and, and personality and one of the other things you can do is you can take folks out to see dolphins dolphin watching and they give you a little bit of money for that so you know you have your own boat you take them out the whole thing is a neat package not a game that's necessarily um uh, Something that blows my mind, you know, but it's one I hang on to because I, I like all those qualities that it does have. And, and it's one that I think I um, I like having around in case I want to pull something this bright and uh, and charming out and put it on the table and, and show folks, hey, let's, let's play this game and then go looking for treasure. There's something just uh, real old-fashioned about that. You know, let's go diving for uh for gems and pearls you know so there you have it that is uh my game under the radar one i have not seen get too much love now i know this was from um a company that doesn't does not normally do board games right so titanic games did a lot of um rpg um stuff and so maybe that's part of it you know that it did not get a lot of attention i don't know it's certainly one that I don't see anyone playing now. The game is certainly a few years old, but um, I don't know. I think it still could do well. Perhaps this is a game that uh, people are playing just just at home. And if so, I'm very glad to, to hear that, you know, if that is the case. And if you're not familiar with it, then maybe you do want to try to find a copy and you yourself can play it at home. So there you have it. 
that is Key Largo for Under the Radar. I'll see you. Hey guys, Tiff here, and I'm freshly back from my summer vacation to Disney World and in the perfect mindset for this week's theme of summer attractions. For this one, my thinking went immediately to the classic family road trip, and there's really no American vacation destination more iconic than Niagara Falls. Luckily, there's a game set there, the aptly titled Niagara. Niagara is a set collection, pick up and deliver game from Rio Grande Games that takes about 45 minutes. You and up to four opponents play as adventurers, riding the rapids, collecting gems, and hopefully avoiding going over the falls as you try to outsmart each other along the way. It's another game that uses the box during gameplay. In this case, you drape the board over the two box halves to create a cardboard waterfall. Then you arrange the clear discs on the river, place seven matching jewels in each of the discovery spaces around the board, and start with both of your canoes on the beach. Each player starts with six paddle tokens and one weather token. On a turn, you choose one token to play, reveal it, and move your canoes that many spaces either up or down the river. And you can only go one direction on your turn. Depending on where each of your canoes are, on land or in the water, you have to move one or both of them the exact number of paddle points on your token. No wasted points allowed. Fortunately, you can also use your paddle points to load and unload gems from the discovery spaces, and it takes two points to accomplish either action. You can also gain gems by stealing them from other players' canoes. All you have to do is land your empty canoe on a space with an opponent's loaded canoe. It may sound easy, but because stealing doesn't cost paddle points, you have to plan well to make sure your full movement ends on a space with a loaded canoe to pull it off. If you choose to play your weather token, you get to move the rain marker one space to the left or to the right. This is important because the weather influences how fast the river moves at the end of each round. The stormier it is, the farther you'll go. Once everyone has played a token, you look to see who played the lowest number. You add the modifier on the weather track to that number and that's how many spaces the river will move. If in the course of the river moving your canoe goes over the falls, you lose the gems on board and you have to pay a gem to place that canoe back at the starting dock. Of course, the ultimate goal of the game is to collect gems, not spend them. You do this by dropping gems off at the starting beach. If you're the first to offload four gems of the same color, five different colored gems, or you just get a total of seven gems, you win the game. As far as table appeal goes, you'd be hard pressed to find a family game better than Niagara. The wooden boats, colorful plastic gems, and cool waterfall mechanism easily draw kids to the table. But a game can't win a Spiel des Jahres and a Mensa Select Award on looks alone. The hand management aspect of the paddle tokens adds a healthy dose of strategy. Because you have to use every token before you get them all back, you really have to plan ahead and collect gems efficiently. I like how this small restrictive rule set forces you to be creative. It's a fun one, so check it out and I'll see you back next time. Hey, hey, everybody. For today's quirky game, we are taking a look at a small card game that, at first glance, might appear to be a children's game, but it's actually a ladder climbing game, and a pretty involved one at that. I'm talking, of course, about Frank's Zoo here, which was published uh, by Rio Grande Games here in the U.S. It's, it's had uh, several other publishers, and the game has this amazing artwork with really cute cool looking cards. You know, I love the, the animal artwork on these. And so the idea here is, as I said, a ladder climbing game, you are going to be playing some animals to the table and then players after you must either play an animal that can best that animal, which is shown here in the little thought clouds above the animals, or they must play more of the same kind. So let's say I play uh, two mice Someone else can play three mice, and that's all right. They can play more of the same. That's basically it. You continue doing that until everybody has run out of cards. Running out of cards earlier, of course, being better. And then after that, the game gets even more involved. Because you see, at that point, partnerships form based on the scores of the players. 
and you deal up and continue playing now with a partner. And so the game has this very interesting ebb and flow, changing partnerships throughout the game. And again, it's the kind of game that I think would be misleading to folks if they just saw this cover, just maybe got a glimpse of the cars themselves. But there's a, a very interesting involved game here for fans of trick-taking, fans of ladder-climbing games. Not something uh, silly from the look of it, which is why I think it makes for a very quirky game. It's the kind of thing that someone just at first glance would see you playing with a bunch of your friends and think, why are you playing a children's game? But really, it's not. And I find the artwork very charming, as I said. I don't find it to be a detriment, except maybe to uh, the game's ability to sell itself while sitting on, you know, a store's shelf. But hopefully this is something that will catch your eye. Uh, I love the, the idea of uh, having a ladder climbing game that uses this theme because it fits really well and it does make it a little bit easier to teach to folks when you tie it to this evolutionary chain idea, right? This, this animal is bigger than this animal so it can trump it, you know, that's the idea. And so um, a really cool ladder climbing game, one that I've enjoyed quite a bit. I would recommend it, again, to fans of trick-taking and ladder climbing. If you are a fan of uh, Tichu, for instance, this could be a filler for you because Tichu is very complicated, but this one uh, could fill the same shoes when you are looking for something that is perhaps more accessible to more folks. So there you have it. That is Frank's Zoo for our quirky game. So since we're talking summer fun amusement, my designer of Spotlight this week is on Craig Van Ness. Now he's one of the guys that you know as Mr. Hasbro. He designed everything from Star Wars The Queen's Gambit to the new Risk Star Wars to the Heroescape to the Magic the Gathering Arena of the Planeswalker. But he did do a game which is very amusement-like and it's called Roller Coaster Tycoon. Now I really like this game. This is an older game. It came out in the early 2000s. But it's a lot of fun you know you're kind of investing building up a park and trying to you know have the best roller coasters and the best things and it's it's something that i really enjoy i love the theme of roller coasters i love the theme of of theme parks i mean you know even to this day i love still going to the amusement park going on roller coasters and doing all that and if you want that same feel or the feel of like owning a park then roller coaster tycoon is one game that i would highly recommend if you're looking for that feel of being the owner of a park and putting in the best rides and doing all that. So again, like I said, Craig Van Ness, amazing designer, obviously did a lot of games that don't need to talk about here since we're talking amusement, but he's done Roller Coaster Tycoon, Star Wars The Queen's Gambit, Star Wars Risk, Magic The Gathering, Arena of Planeswalker, Heroescape, a bunch of great games, and that's my designer spotlight, Craig Van Ness. everybody. You may think about roller coasters or the beach when you think about the summer, but I think about ice cream. And that made me think about Brain Freeze, which is telepathy games kind of kid-friendly take on the more complex telepathy game that I also own and recommend. But Brain Freeze has this awesome kid-friendly motif, and I've played it a bunch with my seven-year-old daughter and my mother, and it's kind of cool how much we all love this game. Reminiscent of the classic game Mastermind, in Brain Freeze, players are racing to figure out their opponent's secret sweet treat. Each player selects a secret square and marks it on their shield with the column and row location, as well as the type of treat and the flavor. Players take turns guessing a treat by stating its type, flavor, and location. If any element of the guess is correct, the player must answer yes, no more, no less. 
So if my guess is F6 chocolate popsicle and the answer is yes, then I know this secret treat could be in row F, column 6, or be chocolate, or be a popsicle, or some combo of all of those. Not so helpful. But let's say my guess is D2 bubblegum snow cone and the answer is no. Then I know I can mark off all of row D, all of column two, and all of the bubblegum and all of the snow cones. There's a handy little grid in the upper right of the board to help you track your eliminated flavors and treats. Players will slowly eliminate different elements until they finally have enough information to solve the secret treat. There's no winning by accident. A player has to declare they want to solve for the treat. This is the moment my daughter loves. Her eyes light up and there is a lot of squealing when she gets it right, which is pretty darn often. Brain Freeze is one of those games I genuinely enjoy playing with my kids. It's simple and engaging enough for them, but there is real deduction and logic at play. It's so great watching my daughter work out which treats and flavors have been eliminated, and I love that she legitimately beats me at this game. So whether you're going to play in the heat of the summer or on a rainy winter night, just make sure you have some ice cream or popsicles on hand as a thematic victory treat. See you next time. Board gaming is a wonderful pastime that you can enjoy all year round, but it's especially appealing during the winter when you can stay inside, get cozy, and throw down some board gaming. But what about during the summer when you want to go outside, enjoy the nice weather, but you'd like to bring a game along with you. Today on Board Games Meet Dot Dot Dot, I'm going to be showing you some games that I think travel to the outside quite well, especially during those windy and wet months outside. Here we go. One of my favorite games to bring along when I don't know what the weather will be like is Hive. Hive is a two-player abstract game, comes in this carrying pouch, and the pieces are completely plastic, so you don't have to worry about the wind, you don't have to worry about the pieces getting wet and ruined. It's a wonderful traveling game, wonderful outside game. I would recommend it for picnics, uh, you can bring it along if you are going to a pool. So look into it, and maybe next time you're heading out, you can just grab the pouch, throw it in your bag, and head right out of the door. Let's say you want to play with more than two players, but moisture is still your main concern. In that case, I recommend Deluxe Hanabi. This one has all plastic pieces, so you can play the award-winning game here with up to five players just about anywhere. It's a deduction game, so bring it along next time you want to go outside and are feeling like solving some puzzles. So how about if you want to get the whole family involved? In that case, let me recommend Pyramids. Pyramix here is a simple, attractive game with an Egyptian theme, and while it's not as water resistant as some of the other games I've showed you, all you really need is a park bench, and pretty soon you'll be uh, sliding out cubes and scoring points like a champ. Check this one out if you uh, want to get everybody playing. Pyramix. How about if your main concern is not the wind, but a plain surface? If you don't have one, let me recommend a couple of games. The first, Spyfall. Spyfall here is a wonderful deduction social game and all you really need to do is hand each player a card, sit with an earshot of each other, and you are playing. My other recommendation also travels really well, and that is Lie, this tiny little game which plays a lot like Liar's Dice and you are going to be holding all the cards you have in the game, so no need to put any cards down and you'll be uh, bluffing your way to victory in no time. Check both of these out, Spyfall and Lie. So hopefully that gives you some ideas for your upcoming adventures. Get out there and have some fun, board games or otherwise. See ya. Hi folks, Rebecca and Hunter from Two Player Showdown here, and when summer hits for our family, we think parks and we think national parks. Nothing represents that better than Trekking the National Parks by Charlie Bink, and it is a two to six player, 30 to 60 minute game. Yeah, it's really super lightweight. I would even put it lighter weight than uh, Ticket to Ride. It's great for gamers and non-gamers alike. Um, it's very simple. On your turn, all you have is a few choices to make. You get to do two actions, 
They can be the same or different, and all you do is either draw cards, and, or you can use those cards to move around the board to go to visit different places, or you spend those cards as well to get the park cards, which are your victory points in your game. And as you travel around, you're picking up these wonderful little stones in an effort to get the majority of each color, and you get bonuses in the game if you have the majority in a color or you have the most total stones as well. So a really lightweight, fun game um, that, like I said, is even easier than I think than Ticket to Ride to play. Yeah, and what's great is it's really addictive for all ages. Our little ones like to play it, and we've played it with gamers and non-gamers alike. And I think part of the appeal is just the components and gameplay. I mean, if you look, the pieces are really solid. And the stones are beautiful, of course. You know, they're little stones. The cards are really a good size, and they're really easy to read. Really like those a lot. It comes with the handy-dandy player cheat sheet. So you, if you're not used to knowing what you need to do for your turn, you can cheat and check that out. And it comes with an awesome little bag that you can put the stones in to keep them and keep track of those as well. So, yeah, the the theme just really hits home for us because as a family, we love love going to the national parks. That's one of our favorite vacations, and we've hit almost every park in our area. We're trying to spread out as much as we can, and in fact, it's one of our goals, kind of our bucket list, to travel all over the United States and see every single park at some point. Which is another thing that is a great perk with this game, besides the really cool, handy dandy, really easy to read rule book. By the way, it comes with its own park guidebook that has information on all of our national parks. So it's got a little bit of information and pictures about each one. So you, if you have any interest in it, you can check it out and learn more about them yourself. So Yeah, one, one thing I want to say about this game, it's only available from the publisher. So if you want to buy it, I suggest going to their website. Um, or you can get it on Amazon, and but that kind of indirectly goes to the pu publisher as well. So I would encourage you just to buy it straight from the publisher. Yeah, it's well worth tracking down. Pun intended. <laughs> so thank you so much for watching. Cool catchphrase! And that, everybody, wraps up our episode. A big thanks to the contributors. A big thank you to all of you again for both tuning in and participating in our contest. And I will see you again in a couple of weeks where we're going to be talking 3D games. Any game that has a significant 3D element to it. It's really eye-catching on the table because of the, the 3D elements. So come on back for that if you are looking for some cool uh crowd pleasing games and as always hey stay a friend of the blend i'll see you